guys so much for being with us this morning and for joining us. And I kind of want to start off with that because it is Good Friday. Good Friday is an amazing day within the church community. And yeah, it's just a privilege that you decided to come and join us this morning. So that really is an honor. And I am trying to use no notes, so we'll see how I go. Uh, for the kids in the room, that could be a good or a bad thing. It either means my message is going to be like 20 minutes or 45 minutes. So we'll just, we'll see. Steve doesn't want a 45 minute message because he's got two little grandkids in him. But let's get moving. I want to look this morning at, at Good Friday at Matthew chapter 27, verse 24 to 31. And I want to look at this story because I think it shows us something pretty amazing when we dive into it. So let's dive into a bit of this story. This is what we read. And this is the ESV version. If you read a different version, it won't sound the same. But it's all right. It's still the Bible, I promise. So here's what it says. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barbes, Barbes, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Now, if you don't know what's happening so far in this story, and you've never heard that passage, I'll fill you in, and I want to look at three things. The first is how Pilate kind of acts cowardly. So if you're following along in the story, what's happened so far is Jesus has made the Jewish leaders really mad. So they bound him out. They take him to Pilate. Pilate interrogates him. And Pilate can't really find fault with this guy. And crucifixion is supposed to be for the baddest of the baddest people. The people who really deserve it. And he interviews and he's like, I don't think Jesus deserves it. So he tries all these things to get Jesus free. He tries to talk some sense into Jesus. He tries to then get this other prisoner released. Because he thought, hey, if I get this really bad prisoner in Jesus, maybe they'll let him go. He sees this isn't really working. He sees a riot is about to take place. So he does the cowardly thing, washes his hands, and says, whatever happens next isn't on me, guys. And then he goes, peace out, and he goes back to his fortress. And I think it's important to point that out when we look at this story. The second thing I want to point out is that the crowd was a renegade crowd. What I mean by that, in verse 20 of Matthew, we kind of read how this crowd was persuaded by the Pharisees and the elders. They were kind of persuaded and convinced to go along with what they were pushing, with the agenda they were wanting to have happen, which was Jesus dying on the cross. So you kind of have a crowd here that's kind of had their arm twisted in a sense. They might have got some money for it. Who knows? They might have got a better position of power. We just know that the Pharisees and the elders persuaded this crowd make sure the right people were in the room to get what they wanted done. I think it's important to remember that. And then the third thing, and I wish they made his name easier to say, Barbaeus. Barabbas. Barabbas? That's Australian. Oh, you guys, Barabbas, Barbaeus, whatever. Mr. B over there. I'll call him Mr. B. I struggle with talking. So talking's never been my strong point. Probably shouldn't have got into this gig, but hey, it's too late now. But back to the point, he was a notorious prisoner. That's what we find out. We don't know what he's done, but he's done something bad, and he deserves to be where he is. And he's granted freedom instead of Jesus. So before Pilate washes his hands, you have both of these. You have Mr. B and Jesus standing there. And Pilate goes, look. It's custom around this time to release one of these. Who do you want me to release? Thinking there's no way they'll let this notorious prisoner go. 
Surely this is going to make them see some sense that Jesus isn't that bad. He hasn't done anything to deserve this. And that doesn't work. Mr. B gets his freedom. And I want to keep reading this story. Because there's more that happens. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. And they gathered the whole battalion before him. And before I go any further, I want to let you know how big a battalion can be. So a battalion could be anywhere between 400 to 1,200 soldiers. So if we're at the lower end, and we can just say, for this story's sake, that it's 400. That's 400 people right now that are getting gathered around Jesus. It isn't a small group. You know, we couldn't fit this battalion in our church right now. Our church wouldn't be big enough for 400 people. So that's how many people are in it. And it's important to know that we keep reading the story. This is what we read. And they stripped him and put on a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. And put a reed in his white right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. And took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, and put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. Something really interesting that I find throughout all that is that the battalion takes their anger out on Jesus. You know, a lot of times in the Bible we talk about the Romans being the enemy because we're, you know, from this Jewish perspective. But if you think about it from the Roman side, this battalion probably had Jewish terrorists, as they would have called them, that would have killed their friends. That would have probably said horrible things to them and done horrible things to them. And this battalion of 400 to 1,200 people take out all their anger on Jesus. They spit on them. They mock them. They hit them with a reed. After Jesus has already been beaten, with earlier we read that Jesus was scourged, that's getting a whip that's got like metal spikes on it, or spikes of bone. So Jesus is already beaten and bloody. And he gets more. Because this battalion's angry as well. And they take out their anger on Jesus. And I think something that's really amazing in this story, and it's why I love Good Friday, is that we can kind of see that Jesus holds space for all of me and you. What I mean by that is sometimes we think Jesus can't handle certain parts of us. Right? He can only handle the good stuff. He can't handle the bad sides of me. He can't handle the darker side, so we hide those away. But I love how this story kind of shows us that Jesus holds space for all of us. He holds space for every part of us, everything within our makeup. Which is amazing, because the biggest need we have as humans is to be heard and understood. And Jesus does that for us. He hears us and he understands us. He holds space for us. And we see that in the stories of Good Friday that we dive into every time this time of year comes around. We see that when I'm a coward like Pilate. Because we all can be cowardly sometimes. Jesus holds space for that. He hears me and he understands. When we don't stand for justice because we want more money or power, like the crowd and the Pharisees, Jesus can hold space for that. Because we see it in this story. And I know no one would have ever done this, but 
when we take out our anger on him like the Roman battalion, Jesus can hold space for that. Sorry, I smiled. That was my family, so. I'm a little bit biased. I think they're pretty good. But I think that's amazing to think about because how often do we blame God for stuff when we're angry? Like when life's going right, we kind of forget to say, oh, thank you, God. But the minute something goes wrong, oh, God, where are you? God, you're horrible. I'm so angry at you. What I love is that Jesus can hold space for that. I don't have to put on a face. If I'm angry, he can handle it. And we see that in this story. And I think for me, this is why I can call today Good Friday. Because if we're honest, there's not that much that's honestly good about it if you're reading the story so far. It's Jesus hasn't raised from the dead. If you have Jesus being beaten, mocked, spit on, when he's done nothing. Led to a cross right after having 400 people surround you, mock you, say, Hail King of the Jews, and then spit on you, and then hit you with the reed. And then once they all kind of, I guess, ran out of saliva so they couldn't spit anymore, they decided, oh, that's enough. Let's take this stuff off of them. And they take the crown of thorns off, and they get him dressed, and then he has to pick up his cross to go get crucified. Which is the most painful way to die. Because the Romans were good at it. They knew it hurt. We often forget that crucifixion, people die from not being able to breathe. Because to breathe, you would have to put weight on where they nailed you. And eventually your body would get tired of that. So this is what happens on Good Friday. It's what we talk about every year. And I think for me, the reason I can call it Good Friday is throughout the story, I see a Savior that can hold space. I see that Jesus holds space and does the work to show us his love wins. He doesn't just hold space and do nothing. He holds space and then he picks up and carries his cross for us. To show us his love wins. That's what makes today Good Friday. And it's why I think on Good Friday, I really want felt to remind you guys that Jesus is waiting to hold space and do the work to show you his love wins. Because that's the love disruption that we're looking at this whole month. This love of Christ that disrupts things. And I believe what we find on Good Friday and the love of Christ that's revealed can really change our lives. It can really show us that we don't have to have it all together. You know, you don't have to wear suits all the time. And you can wear suits and sneakily wear your Hulk socks underneath that are mismatched. It's all right. You can mess up and not say Mr. B's name right. You can get angry sometimes. You can get upset. You don't have to hide any of that. Because Christ can hold space for it. And he's waiting to. And then he wants to do the work to show you that his love changes your life. And it can have a flow on effect and change the lives of those around you. And that's why we gather on this special day. And we call it Good Friday. It's because we see something amazing about God. Something amazing about the character of God. And I just want to close in prayer. And then I'll get the worship team back up. They're going to do one song. And then we're going to have some morning tea. Because we're going to wait to have communion till you know, we can celebrate the resurrection of Christ. But I really would love for you guys to stay and have some morning tea with us. And I'll just close in prayer before they come up to sing one more song for us.
God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that no matter where we're at on our journey with you, that you hold space for us. That you're waiting to just hold space like no one else can. You're waiting to show us and do the work and show us that your love wins. It has the power to change our lives and change the lives of those around us. And I pray that as we celebrate Good Friday, the rest of the day, whatever that looks like for us, if it's picnic lunch or if it's dinner plans or whatever it is, or even if it's just going home and putting our feet up and watching the footy tonight, whatever it is, God, I pray that you'll help us reflect on what you did on this amazing day and how you would constantly do it again and again because it's who you are as creator. And you're an amazing name. Amen.